day. It's good to have you here. We're uh, going to be uh, having a few different things today. It's our church picnic today after the service, so hopefully you can join us down at Rundle Park site too. And uh, we are going to just have an abbreviated, a little more abbreviated service this morning. I've got something to give the dads. We've got a dad video, and uh, we're just all excited to connect. So let me, I'm a little out of breath. I ran in. I'm like, oh! For those of you who don't know, right, for that last three seconds, I was running up on stage. Um, but, you know, God's so good. And we just have to slow down sometimes, right? We get busy. We're jumping from this to that to the other thing, and we stop listening. And God is constantly engaging with us. So the question is, are we going to listen and engage with him? So let's take this time together to grab everything we can because our God is a good God, and the Bible says he constantly wants to give his children good gifts. So let's just open our hearts in a time of prayer and move into a time of singing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this amazing moment. God, that we would really focus that, Lord, we wouldn't allow ourselves to be distracted by all the different things that may be going on right now and spend this time with you. Lord, sometimes I know myself, I can be so focused on this thing, that thing, and not focus on you. Lord, the Bible says that you turn your face towards us and you shine your countenance upon us. So, God, that we would turn our faces, our hearts, our spirits to you and have an amazing encounter with God this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. I'd love for you to be here this morning. Would you just rise up, join with us this morning. Let the blood flow into the legs. Let's give God the day. Hallelujah.
for us, but it has been on out there for a while. Join with us. Let's learn a new one. Good day to pick up something new. Take us back, Lord. Hallelujah, 
Jesus. so much, God, that you are close. Lord, you never leave us or forsake us. You are closer than a brother, the Bible says. Lord, that you stick with us so close. And so, Lord, in the midst of all that, God, help us in drawing closer to you. Lord, that we would experience your presence like never before. And then through us, Lord, others would experience your presence as well. So, God, we just thank you for that. And this time we have together, in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, you can be seated. Thanks, team. It is Father's Day, and I uh, have a little video just before we let the kids go. We brought parenting questions to some of the wisest minds on the planet. You guessed it, dads. This is Ask a Dad. What should I do if my kids won't come when I call them? Turn off the Wi-Fi and watch them all magically appear. Will my children ever let me use the bathroom in peace? Yes, when they move out of your house. When we're playing sports, should I let my kids win? Absolutely not. 
It's not your fault God bless you with incredible athletic talent. Why is there peanut butter on the back of my couch? Why are there Legos in the fridge? No one knows. What if my kids don't think I'm cool? It doesn't matter, because deep down all dads know that they are so cool. How come nobody laughs at my amazing dad jokes? Because you're doing it right. Why can't my kids remember to do their chores? Because that part of a child's brain is reserved for remembering all the things you hoped they'd forget. Why won't my children listen to me? What? How do I get my kid to eat dinner? You look them right in the eyes and you tell them you are going to your friend's house for dinner. Problem solved. As a dad, how can I dress for success? Two words. Cargo shorts. <laughs> Happy Father's Day. <laughs> For you dads, I have some dad's root beer. <laughs> no, I wasn't bringing something else up here. Um, but hey, how often do you get glass bottles anymore? So we will be uh, giving dad's root beer to you guys at the end here as well, so hang around for that uh, and grab that before you head off to the picnic. Uh, children, yes, you can be heading on down to the beach or the sub as uh, your time has come as well. And uh, we're just so glad to be spending time with you guys today, although you will have a little shorter time today as well. Um, that's assuming that I get through my message fast. <laughs> Preachers, man. What's the uh, longest statement a preacher can make? In conclusion, right? <laughs> okay, that's a preaching joke. So we've been journeying through uh, a series on identity and I've been connecting that with, I don't know if you've quite noticed yet or picked it up, uh, but connecting it with names and titles. So that often our identity is is identified with name, right? In the first Sunday, we talked about the fact that we have a family name, just like you do, but we have a spiritual family name that we get from our Heavenly Father. And uh, the one that we generally use around the globe is Christian, but, you know, really, we, we are children of God, right? So, um, actually, in the time of the New Testament, and we'll see one of the verses here that I'm going to be using. But often, the idea of family names wasn't expressed the way we express them. But you were the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, the son of so-and-so, right, as far as boys go. Or the daughter of, and usually it was patriarchal, so it would be the daughter of a man, and then the so forth, the same thing. So there, but there was this sense of lineage, and we see that even in, Jesus' uh, accounts in Matthew and Luke, where they have Jesus' lineage going back to Abraham and then going back to Adam, so that there's this sense of family history, a family dynamic. And we have that spiritually in God, that we are children of God, sons and daughters of God. So we have a family name. And last week, I talked a bit about the title that we have of ambassadors. Um, that's been posted up on YouTube. I haven't, I don't think we posted the link yet to it in um, Facebook yet, but we'll be sure to get that up as uh, last week we had a streaming issue and our stream went down, but we did record it. So that, that is going to be available for you if you missed that. And I certainly want to encourage you to be um, tracking along with that if you're, if you're not, because there's some great sense of purpose, sense of destiny, sense of completeness that we have in our identity in God. Now, today I want to talk about first names. Now, we all have various first names, and maybe some of you have middle names, and, you know, some have multiple names. Wow, the kids are happy about that. 
Way to go, Betty. Uh, my wife is leading the children downstairs this morning. <laughs> um, but, but we have a victorious name. And I want us to consider this. Sometimes you have the name that you're given with at birth, and you may struggle with that, or you may rejoice in that. Um, I know Merrill, my name, means uh, a man of honor or a person of honor. Um, and it comes from Latin back into Greek. So there's, there's this, this idea of honor that's part of that name. Uh, but sometimes people are born with names that meh, aren't as nice. So we're going to look at a few examples of name changes in the Bible. And where God has brought in a name that's victorious for people. And so just because you have the name that you have doesn't necessarily mean that that is the name that God has for you. Sometimes the parents get it right, and we'll look at that too, but sometimes the parents miss out a little bit, and God has different purpose and plans for our lives. So let's consider a couple name changes here um, before we get to the verse I want us to spend a few minutes in. Abram becomes Abraham. So in the Old Testament, Abram was the son of Terah. So sometimes we just think Abraham was his name, but he, that's not the name he was born with. He was born with Abram. And Abram means exalted father or exalted chief or, or leader. And so we have this name that Abraham guess, had when he was born. It's just even hard in my, my brain to think back and flip that, right? And so we read in Genesis 17, 5, God says to him, No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of many nations. And that's before he had kids, right? And so he had this victorious name that God had given him, leading into the destiny God planned for him, and through him for us, as Abraham is considered the father of faith. And so Abraham means father of a multitude. So God had a different desire or design, and he brings that to Abraham. We see that also with Jacob. In Genesis 32, 28, God says, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. So Jacob means one who grabs the heel or a supplanter or one who's going to pull you down so that I can get up over you. <laughs> Right? Because he was the second born. And there was this sense already of, of this, and you see that play out somewhat for him because he does steal his brother's birthright. But God's here after that, and he's actually going to meet his brother. <laughs> he's in this context of, and he set everybody ahead of him. He's like, maybe, maybe they can you know, soften him up because he sends a bunch of stuff as a gift and, and, and God wrestles with him through the night at Peniel. And so we, we have this moment in, in his life and God says, you know, no longer will you be Jacob, but you will be Israel, which means one who persists, prevails, or struggles with God. And so the idea of prevail isn't that he won the fight. Have you ever won a fight with God? Anybody? I've never. <laughs> Some of you laugh, and rightly so, right? But there's this sense of per persistence and struggling with and prevailing through with God that God is rewarding him with now and saying, you know, you've wrestled through to victory with me. Not that you beat God, but you won your battle in that you needed to prevail through some things in your life, in your heart. And so we see this in his life, and God renames him, and we see that play out now. We don't talk about, you know, the nation of Jacob. We talk about the nation of Israel. God sometimes intervenes to also make sure that somebody gets the right name. And so when John the Baptist was born... The day when they name him and he goes to, the, she goes through a purification, they do a purification right, and he gets circumcised, and they come to the naming time, and it says, on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah for his, after his father, but his mother answered, no, you shall be, he shall be called John. 
And if you go back to verse 13 in Luke chapter 1, that's where the angel Gabriel tells Zechariah that, look, you're going to have a son with your wife in your old age, and you're going to name him John. And so there was this big thing because, or as would be in the Hebrew, Johannan. So John is just the Greek word. Zechariah means to meditate on God, to reflect on God. It's this internal thing. But Johannan means God has been gracious. And so there's this sense in which God's grace is coming through John the Baptist to preach about Jesus, right? He comes in the spirit of Elijah. There's all this going on that happens through John. And, and so God purposely named this child for the mission that he had in this world and that he was going to become one who would declare the grace of God and the goodness of God. And we read that in John chapter 1, actually, John the Apostle, where he says, you know, um, that grace and truth came through Jesus. And so there's this sense of that going on. Now, speaking of Jesus, God makes sure he gets the right name too. And so we see in Matthew chapter 1, 21, God, the angel talking to Joseph she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And so the, the Hebrew name is Yeshua, which is from Joshua, and it means that God is salvation. And so we have our Savior in Jesus. Jesus is a Greek word. So we have these things that, that, that we see God either changing names or ensuring names that are part of the victorious destiny that God has for people taking place. Let me bring you to one more New Testament example. Jesus calls Simon Peter. And we see that where there's this moment where Jesus is asking his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Jesus answers Peter after he says his name, that, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so we see here, it's sort of a, 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 a combination here. We have Greek and Hebrew going, and we've got Simon, which was a common Greek name for the time. We have Barjona. <laughs> And bar means son of, and so you would see, um, you know, if you've heard the term bar mitzvah before, right, that's son of the testament or son of the law. So we have, have bar, son of, and for the girls, they would have bat mitzvahs, bat meaning daughter. So we have Simon, son of Jonah. And so there's this idea of lineage, but then God has a destiny for this man, Simon, and his Hebrew name would have been Simeon or Shimeon. And it comes from, in Genesis 29, where um, um, they have a child, and she, her statement is, the Lord has heard that I am hated. Right? So Simeon comes from Shema, which is part of here. And then I, I was really working hard to try and discern the Yun part of that name. <laughs> and even in commentaries, they're like, yeah, it's sort of abstract and unknown. So this is what it comes from, right? These namings that happened out of experiences, and sometimes they were difficult, negative experiences. And Jesus says, but you're going to be a rock, right? Peter is from the Greek, Petros means rock. And, and you know, Peter seemed a little wishy-washy, you know, always two feet in his mouth. He was like, well, Jesus, let's do this. Jesus, let's do this. And, and Jesus' intention for Peter was that he was going to be a solid person, the solid apostle, that the church was going to be part of revolving around his strength. We even see a nicknames going on in the New Testament. You might remember Barnabas, but his real name was uh, Jonah. And so... It's, it's interesting that, that these things are going on in the New Testament. So, let's get down to the meat. 
In Revelation chapter 2, we have this statement. And I'll read it just through once, and then we'll just dissect it a little bit. Revelation 2.17, He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now in Je Revelation 2 and 3, this is the last book in your Bibles. Um, whoops. In, in those two chapters, there's seven churches that Jesus directly addresses and talks about, for the most part, things that he likes and things that he dislikes about what's going on in these churches. So here we have, in this portion, um, the Church of Pergamum. But in each one of these churches that he addresses, his ending for that is to the one who conquers. Now the Greek word is nikao, from which you might recognize Nike, a certain sportswear company that was developed. And that comes from that Greek word, and it means victory. It means to conquer. And so the idea here is that everyone who is victorious, who overcomes, who conquers the struggles that they have, will have these rewards from God. And in this particular case, there are things going on in Pergamum that, that Jesus wants to address. And so I'll take a moment just to give you that context as well. So Jesus says of this church two particular things. He says, where Satan's throne is. That's a pretty interesting ministry context, wouldn't you say? You know, um, Maybe in your minds, in our, our North American minds, maybe we would think of, uh, and maybe some pastors down there think of this, I don't know. But maybe, you know, you're pastoring in Vegas. <laughs> right? Where is the den of sin? Where is the den of, of this, this struggle and this resistance to the work of God? And he calls it Satan's throne. Now, there are different commentators who think different things about this, and so... It could be a reflection of the fact that it was a worship center for the region, and they had a whole bunch of temples there, uh, including one to Zeus, and they had this huge altar to Zeus that was 250 meters over top of the, of the city in a cliff. So everyone could see these worshipers to Zeus in the area. It could also have to do with the fact that the regional proconsul was there, and so people would have to go there to have their things sorted out legally or if they were in trouble with the law and in this case often this is where verdicts that sent Christians to their deaths was carried out. And the other thing was that it was a worship center for emperor worship. And so we may not think of that in our culture. I mean, well, I know some leaders that maybe, you know, presidents, prime ministers who maybe had a little bit of worship going on when they came into office. Think of that like majorly beyond that, <laughs> where they actually worshipped Augustus and Roma, and these, these temples were set up for these leaders that they had had. The other thing that Jesus talks about them was that it was the days of Antipas the martyr, and Antipas was actually killed for his faith. And Jesus says, you haven't, you haven't let your faith go, and you've stayed true to my name, and in, in this culture of persecution and even killing of Christians, you have remained strong with me. But he had a complaint. There was wrong teaching going on that was leading to bad morals and bad actions. And in the context of what we have going on here, it probably has to do with the fact that they were syncretizing, compromising, allowing the worship of idols to mix in with their worship of God so that they maybe wouldn't be persecuted as much because, you know, they could hang out with their families who ate food to offer to idols. And it even talks about sexual immorality. And you have to think of that in the context of worship because they had that as a form of worship in their culture. So it's not just, you know, a sense of sexual immorality, but also in the sense of idol worship as well. And all this goes on in the Satan's throne city. 
and, and so with all this going on, sometimes, you know, you cave in a little here, you cave in a little there, and, and you allow for compromise. And we see that even when he talks, uh, when Jesus talks to this church about Balaam and this history of Balaam's teaching in that it goes back to the book of Numbers and uh, where Balaam was paid <laughs> by a king to try and curse Israel. And God wouldn't allow him to speak curses, but only blessings. But it also says um, elsewhere that um, in Deuteronomy that, that Balaam gave this idea to Balak that what you should do is just allow them to marry into the idolatrous nations that were around them. And through this compromise and through this, this watering down and mixing with that they started worshiping idols as well and trying to still worship God. And that just doesn't work. So, I want to get done. <laughs> Three things are promised here. Number one, he'll give us of the hidden manna. Now, that would be fairly understandable to people who are of the Bible and the manna that, that the Israelites ate through the wilderness. But there was manna that was hidden and maintained. The manna would only last for a day except for the weekends. But there was a pot of manna that was hidden in the Ark of the Covenant. And if you think about Jesus in his life, he says in the Gospel of John that he is the manna that came down from heaven. And so Jesus will give of himself to sustain us and to give us the strength we need to move through our times. And recognizing, you know, the, the amazing grace of God is that our victory is his victory. It's when we're weak that we're strong in him, right? We don't have any strength in of ourselves, and Jesus is promising the strength we need to overcome and continue overcoming, even as we have victory. And so we get to, to draw on God as part of our victorious name that you have, that 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 you get to have that destiny from God, that God is strengthening you and encouraging you and equipping you to move forward in. The second thing is that you will be given a white stone. So there's several possibilities to this understanding, but in the Roman culture, there would be this understanding that a white stone would often be used in verdicts in court, right? In the context of this being the pro-council's home city and a verdicts being given here that, that innocence was given in the form of a white stone. If you got a black stone, you were in trouble. But if you got a white stone, you were set free. But also within that culture, and in a sense of victory, white stones were given to victorious generals who would no longer have to pay taxes. Anyone wish they could get a white stone? <laughs> um, or gladiators who were considered to be so victorious and, and have such a winning streak and have put forth so much of themselves into the, in the glad, gladial games that they would be given a white stone that would free them from their responsibilities in that and they would be set free and set up for life as well. And so there's a sense of victory that comes with this white stone. And then lastly, a new name is written upon it, given specifically to the individual that reflects this victory in your life, that shows that you have and will be victorious. And so this, the word new can be both completely new or renew. And so whether you have a new name from God that's different from the name that your parents gave you at birth, or whether your parents got it right, they heard from God, just like John and Jesus, and, and you're going to have this name renewed in a special way for you, or maybe you'll get another middle name, or what have you. There is a new name that you will receive reflecting the victory that God has accomplished in and through you. And that is how God sees you. 
You know, when my wife says my name, <clears throat> assuming that it's within the context of, you know, love and adoration and not within the context of we're having a fight, um, <laughs> right? Because we all have disagreements. That the heart behind this name that God has for us is one of victory and destiny and purpose and him loving us so much so that we hear, just like Jesus heard, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. That God has your name and your name is full of love and purpose and victory in it. And sometimes maybe you're born like Jacob. You know, there, there, I've, I've looked through name books. We looked through name books when we were going to name our children, looking for meaning and, and praying that God would give us the right names for them and that kind of thing. And some names have, you know, bad connotations to them. In the Bible, there was even one person born named Ichabod, which means the spirit has departed. Like, thanks, Right? But that is not the name God has in his heart for you. God's heart and naming of you is full of victory. Full of triumph. Full of conquering. In fact, in Romans, Paul says that in him we've been made more than conquerors. And so, I want to encourage you today to really have God's heart in mind, that God is offering you a new name, hidden manna, a white stone, and that, that receiving that and embracing that is embracing the triumph and victory God intends for you over top of the temptations of this world, the struggles we can have with persecution and difficulty for our faith, those kinds of things that Jesus says, if you choose to conquer in me, if you choose to embrace this, I have something planned for you already. Isn't it great that God already has this thought out for us? He's not working off the seat of his pants. So, whether you're aware of your victorious name or not, you can know that God has a name that calls you to victory. And some people I know have, have received that kind of name, and there are certain cultures in the world that have where you grow into maturity and you get an adult name, right? This, you've passed through this rite of passage into adulthood. That God has a victorious name for us. And so my encouragement for you is rather than focusing on the name, because <laughs> that can be really like, oh, Jesus, tell me what name, you, you know, like that kind of thing it can just be frustrating and lead you where, you know, if God wants to tell you, fine, listen and hear and, and, and embrace that and, and search out that meaning. But maybe search out the meaning first. That God has purpose and plan for victory in your life. And often the things that you most wrestle with are the things that you will prevail through to your new name, just like Jacob. So, spend time listening to God about how he intends to make you victorious. And, and wait to see how that plays out in your life because God has a victorious name for you. Maybe it's the one you were born with. Maybe it's something new and fresh and victorious. Let me pray for you and then we have some special announcements and then we got a picnic to be in. God, I just thank you for your grace and goodness that you have names for us full of victory and triumph and grace. God, I just pray that everyone here, Lord, would embrace the grace that you have for them. That, Lord, you were such a good father that when we became your spiritual children, you named us, just like our physical parents did when we became their kids too. And so, God, I just pray that as we move forward in our walk with you and our identity with you, we would have greater senses of the victory you intend, us in our, intend for us in our lives and that we would walk into it knowing full well you have made that way possible for us. 
and that you have strengthened us for it. God, whatever our struggles we face, whatever we are, are called to as an environment to serve you in, Lord, even if it is where Satan's throne is, that, God, we can triumph in you over all those things. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple important announcements. Well, more than a couple this morning, actually. Um, next Sunday is Pastry with the Pastor. If you're new and you haven't connected with me in a Pastry with the Pastor time, I'd love to connect with you. But also just to let you know that if you are fairly new to, I'll be reaching out to you. We've got um, just putting together some fresh information about the church and how you can be involved. And we certainly want to encourage involvement in, as part of the church body because that's how we even better connect with one another and grow together. Of course, we have the church picnic. And even if you're online this morning, I'd encourage you to come down to Rundle Park Site 2, which is go all the way down the road in Rundle Park to the bottom. And there's a parking lot right by the ACT Center. Park in there and then just hang a left as you're walking out of the parking lot past the little playground. And uh, you'll be see site number one and then site number two over there. And that's where we're going to be. Ladies, uh, if you haven't heard already, uh, Betty's having a bonfire at our place. We'll be uh, lighting up our fire pit on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And you're welcome to come and just for a time of encouragement with one another. And uh, I will be hopefully fogging my grass because I know it's rained a lot and some mosquitoes are around, so we're working on that. This summer, uh, for all you parents of kids, teens, we are having our drop-in summer soccer again. And that'll be on Tuesday nights at 7 o'clock, just east of the church here in Sifton Park. Just look for the big group with the cooler with freezies in it. Just uh, encourage you a little that way. And uh, we'll have pennies out there so the kids can recognize whose team they're on and, and uh, just be having a good time playing soccer and connecting. So I encourage you to be doing that. We're just thankful that uh, um, Julian, one of our uh, young men here, is going to be helping lead that as he's a real sports guy. And uh, Pastor Jacqueline will be there. And hopefully some others can come and join in and connect as parents while their kids have a good time doing that. Ages... We're, we're pretty loose. The, it's been really um, successful in just being open as anyone could run around and kick a ball. We, we just encourage the teenagers to be mindful of little kids and not run them over, you know? <laughs> uh, unlike the dad wisdom where, hey, you know, if they're not, you know, a sports person, then, yeah, we don't do that. Um, our church business meeting, our annual meeting, we're not waiting for the fall this year. We are going to have that on Sunday, July the 10th, after our morning service. So again, we'll be uh, wrapping that up a little earlier as well and uh, ensuring that we get started at 1130. Um, there's some constitution changes to, to adjust from um, the uh, general conference I was just at in May. So they've uh, made some changes there that we need to reflect in ours. Uh, part of that is basically just allowing for electronic engagement, so we don't have that written in clearly, so it will allow for those kinds of things. Plus, there's a shift because our um, statement of essential truths and uh, positions and practices have been shifted a little bit in our general uh, constitution of bylaws, and we need to adjust our um, constitution to allow that to properly connect with us so that we're aligning ourselves that way as well. So um, you'll be getting that information coming out in the next week as, uh, as well as the new and renewed Statement of Essential Truths and Positions and Practices. So you can read through those and connect with those as well. So just be aware that we'll be having at that time. And we'll do it a hybrid style again if people need to uh, zoom in for the meeting. But I uh, really want to encourage people to, if possible, be here as uh, it's going to be right after Sunday morning service anyways. And we appreciate your giving. Uh, the, here it is at, uh, just out the door here with our debit machine and uh, online at freedomcenter.org slash give. As uh, we're really engaging with our community and trying to be a blessing, uh, if you remember the whole series from last month on bless. And if you've got testimonies about how that's been going for you, who remembers what bless meant? Okay, I'm not going to drag it out too long. <laughs> 
Begin with prayer. Listen, eat, serve, and share your story. So we'll work on that. We'll get it up on the wall. Remember to have your little card, which I dropped one here, um, to just remind you of those things. We were called to be a blessing because God has blessed us. God bless you. I'll let you go. Don't forget to connect with your kids and hopefully see you at Rundle Park. If you need any directions or help with that, please contact me here and uh, we will get you there. God bless you all.